Hello everyone, this is Dr. Gene Simmons from All World Christian Center in Grants Pass, Oregon. We're here to, to uh, this is our first time to do this, so we're, we're going to be studying the Bible. We've been, uh, on Wednesday nights, been going through uh, the, the book of Acts, and uh, tonight we're going to be on the chapter 23. So we're going to go through line upon line from uh, verse 1 all the way through, and and uh, find out what the Apostle Paul uh, went through and what we may have to and there's some good things in here that we can learn and I want to we'll share that as we go so uh, let's pray father thank you Lord for your word thank you Lord for giving us wisdom and understanding and thank you Lord for moving the, the Word of God from our head to our heart Lord so we can be like Jesus thank you for it and Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Okay, I'm over here in chapter 23, and uh, basically I'm going to kind of go back uh, to the last couple of verses of chapter 22, uh, so we kind of got to feel where Paul is. He's uh, in a hard spot here. Uh, in verse 30 in chapter 22, it says, The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and let him uh, and set him before them. So basically, Paul's in the hands of the Romans and the Jews are there and they're upset with him. They want to kill him and uh, they want to take him out. They don't want him going out and preaching anymore because they are uh, under the uh, mosaic law and uh, they don't they don't like this grace thing so let's find out what happens and what Paul has to go through and uh, you know as we go through and do what God's called us to do uh, we may have some obstacles in the way and we need to know, to know how to deal with that so we're gonna learn some good lessons here in chapter 23 verse 1 it says then Paul looking earnestly at the council said men and brethren I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Uh, I'm going to stop right there and kind of explain that. Uh, Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was raised up under the law and studied under Gamaliel, the best teacher. Uh, when he was under the law, he went out and did what he was supposed to do. And he was a leader. But in fact, his job was to go out and, and uh, kill and, and arrest Christians. Uh, uh, and get him away from that goofy gospel that was going out there until God got a hold of him. And we already read on how uh, he, he, was, he was caught on the road to Damascus, uh, blinded. God spoke to him, took him in, and, and uh, a little guy in, in Damascus prayed for him named Ananias, uh, Ananias and, and uh he was not only saved, but he set free, and he heard the voice of God and commanded God. So he was baptized and and uh, called into the ministry. And uh, so here he says, uh, "Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day." Well, he didn't know the gospel uh, uh, when he was doing what he was doing. He was just trying to live through the the law. So he was doing the law the best he could, but. Uh, that the, nobody lived perfect under the law, and so uh, he needed Jesus, and he's finding that out right now. So he found that out on the road to Damascus and gave his life to Jesus. So in verse 2, he says, <clears throat> Now the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Now, if you, the, the word Ananias is... We should study that. Uh, there's three of them in the in, in the book of Acts, uh, um, and what we have to realize is that this Ananias isn't the same one that uh, that lied to the Holy Spirit and and was carried out dead. Uh, so basically, this Ananias was a high priest, and the Apostle Paul didn't know it at this time. So. Uh, when Ananias tells these these guys to smack him in the mouth, it's not very. It doesn't make the Apostle Paul very happy. So let's see what happens. Verse three says, "Then Paul said to him, 
God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you are a judge. Uh, you, you sit to judge me according to the law, and you command me to be struck contrary to the law. So Paul's getting right in his face and calls the 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 high priest a whitewashed tombstone. Tombstone. Basically, what what he was referring to in that was that a whitewashed tombstone, a, a, a wall, whitewashed wall, it was looking good on the outside, but it was rotten underneath the paint. Okay, so it was rotten wood that was look, made to look good. So what he was doing, and he was dealing with this high priest who whose heart was really wicked, and he was commanding Paul to be beaten before Paul, Paul was ever convicted. It was they had, they had no conviction on Paul. So Paul jumps back at it. Let's see what happens to Paul now. In verse 4 he says, And those who stood by said, Do not revile God's high priest. Verse 5, Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am being judged. So, basically, Paul's upset because of what happened to him. And uh, he did uh, realize that he didn't know that this Ananias was the high priest. And he had made a mistake, and he readily admits it by quoting scriptures that said, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So uh, he acknowledged the pure fact that he did something that was not right, but he didn't know that Ananias was the high priest. Then over here in verse 6, he says, uh, he, he, The Apostle Paul is not stupid, and he knows the religious. Uh, uh, history of the Jewish people and there were two sects of them. One of them were like Democrats and the other one were Republicans. So Paul's uh, they're, they're called Pharisees and Sadducees. And uh, the Pharisees uh, as we've read in the past the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels and spirits. The Sadducees only believed in the, the first five books of the Bible and they did not believe in in angels and spirits and the, the resurrection of the dead. So they rejected all the rest of the Bible except for the first five books. So the Apostle Paul realized that there's, a, there's an, an open door there. So he hammers he hammers the, the Sadducees and all of a sudden war takes out. Let's see what happens. Verse 6. When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried, cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and, and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Oh, man. So he, he believed in resurrection. As a matter of fact, he's now born again. He knows he's, he's going to re be resurrected along with Jesus. But this, So, verse 7, he says, And when they had... When he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Uh -oh. Verse 8. For the Sadducees there, there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Uh-oh. Verse 9. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Verse 10. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, that's the Roman guy, uh, fearing lest Paul might be uh, pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them, and bring him into the barracks. 
So guess what? Here these guys are, are going for it. They want to kill him. And all of a sudden, Paul brings the and brings division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they go into a war. And the Pharisees join up on his side because he says he's a Pharisee. And Paul's not stupid. And God realizes that. So Paul saves his neck. And the Romans jump in there to protect them. Now let's see. Verse 11 is a really important uh, important part because uh, this is something that uh, we have to realize. That we have a God. And when we're born again, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is there to protect us and speak to us. So let's look at verse 11. He says, But the following night... The Lord stood by him and said, now this is God speaking to the Apostle Paul. He says, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear with witness at Rome. Now here we go back and we stop and think about uh, all the prophecies that, that Paul got uh, had from different people as he came, as he did his journey don't go to Jerusalem because they're going to take you out they want to kill you they want to do this don't go to Jerusalem hey Paul don't go to Jerusalem but Paul knew that he had to go to Jerusalem so he was uh, he was uh, uh, directed by the spirit of God to do this and uh, so but he was warned that there's going to be some problems when he got there and there definitely was problems when he got there. So he's in Jerusalem and he's going through it. But God speaks to him personally. He's saying, okay, God, Paul, you did what I told you to do. Now you're going to go to Rome and you're going to do the same thing when you get to Rome. And it may not be easy when you get there. So basically, so Paul had to take courage at that point. And this is a place where in our lives... When the enemy comes out and tries to stop us, we have to be courageous and keep on going. Okay, so let's take a look at verse 12. He says, And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would rather they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Whoa! We have 40 of them dudes. Wanting to kill Paul. And so they're making, uh, trying to figure out a way how they can get him. One of the nice things that Paul has on his side is Jesus. Jesus is on his side. And Jesus just spoke to him, told him that you're going to Rome. So he knows he's going to Rome, right? Verse 13. Now where there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. 14. They came to the chief priests. And the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Oh, Lord. So they went and talked to the top dudes, the top Jewish leaders there, and told them what they were planning on doing and said, Okay, uh, chief priest, we want you to get a hold of the Romans and tell them to, that you want to have a talk with, with, with Paul again. We have some more things, uh, but he'll never get there because we're going to kill him on the road before he gets there. So they've got this plan. Verse 15. Now you, the affair, go together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down uh, to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So they're, they're planning on taking him out before he ever gets uh, to talk. Verse 16. Uh-oh. God's got somebody on the inside. How many of you know there's God's got somebody on this inside for you? When we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to send workers out into the, to the field, God's got people out there that can help you. When he tells you to do something, you aren't in this on your own. Verse 16. So when Paul's sister's son... That's Paul's nephew. Heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Aha! Oh, this is the first time we've even heard that he had a sister or, or a nephew. But I do remember that uh, when, after Paul was saved, he went back to Tarsus where he was, was at home. And he spent time there. 
And I have an idea. He shared the gospel and possibly his sister and her son got saved under Paul's ministry when he was there. So here's this guy, this young uh, nephew of Paul's, and he goes and tells Paul what's being planned. So Paul has to do something now. So verse 17 says, Then Paul came to, to one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he, was, uh, he has something to tell him. Verse 18. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Verse 19. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside, and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than forty of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. Verse 22. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him to tell no one that you have revealed these things to him. Okay, now the Romans know it, Paul knows it, and the Jews don't know they know it. That's a pretty good deal. Like I said, good. Paul's got Jesus on his side. Okay, so, verse 23. Now the Romans take, go on, here it goes. And he called the two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Okay, so we got a small army right there. Several hundred people, soldiers, to protect Paul. Those 40 guys are not going to have much success in getting to Paul. So, in verse 25, he says, He wrote a letter in the following manner. Verse 26, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was, was about to be killed by them. Coming with troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they, they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but he had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also command his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So basically, Paul's off the hook. The Romans are in uh, or the Jews are having trouble getting to him. So he got all these soldiers taking him to Caesarea, which is a pretty good march from Jerusalem. You're going to be going north. In verse 31. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipas and to Patras. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. And when they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what providence he was from. And when he understood that he was from Sicilia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers have come. And he commanded them to be kept in Herod's praetorium. And that's the end of chapter 23. So what can we learn from this? But Paul was commanded to go do something by, the, by God. God had a, a plan. He wants, to take, wants us to take the gospel into all the world. He wants us to, to uh, share that good news. But the devil doesn't want it to happen. The devil seeks whom he may devour. He's going to do everything he can to take us out. But Jesus says, I'm coming that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
Okay, so the Apostle Paul is getting to know Jesus, and Jesus is speaking to him. So he's a, a courageous guy. He knows he could be killed, but he said, doesn't make any difference to me. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. You kick out, you kill me, uh, uh, God will just raise somebody else up. So basically, the Apostle Paul is a very courageous guy, and this is something that God wants us to do. As a matter of fact, Jesus uh, told us to take courage. Take courage. And uh, that's, a, that's something that we have to do individually. We have to take it. God will not force us on it. God didn't force Paul to do this. Paul just told him, this is what I want you to do. And, and because of Paul's relationship with Jesus, because he loved the Lord and wanted to be obedient to the Lord, he did what God told him to do, uh, which is take the gospel into all the world. And, uh, and when God says, go, go to Jerusalem, go to Rome, he says, Paul's going to Rome now. So as we get to the end of chapter 24, we're going to find out some of the stuff that happens to him in, in the next chapter and find out that, that uh, God's gonna, never going to leave you and he's not going to forsake you. If Jesus is your Lord, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And uh, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So I just want to encourage you to go forth and be like Jesus. And, and Paul did what he did as an example. He wasn't there for the big bucks. He wasn't there for, to be a celebrity. He wasn't there to, take, uh, to be better than Jesus or, or higher up. He was there to be a servant and to, to do the work, he, work God's called him to do. So I just want to encourage you today to take Paul as an example and be courageous. God tells you to do something, do it. And he will not leave you and he won't forsake you. And you can get the job done. Okay? And uh, so I'm going to end there. Let's pray. Father, I just praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for the example we have before us from the Apostle Paul, who has taken the gospel into all world under all these circumstances, Lord. We pray right now, I pray for each person that's hearing this message, Lord, as we go and do what you've called us to do, Lord, that you'll give us the courage we, as we take it, Lord, and the protection and the wisdom to do what you've called us to do. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we ask you for your direction. We ask you would, uh, would, would be with us as we go forth. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit would destroy the yoke that's before us. We give you praise and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. And Lord, I pray for each person that's out there that's hearing this word. I pray right now you'd meet their needs according to your riches and glory. I pray you'd heal their bodies because by, by Jesus' stripes they were healed. I thank you, Lord, that your word is life to them that find it and health to all their flesh. And according to your word, we thank you, Lord, for, for uh, the anointing that destroys that yoke. And thank you that we can accomplish what you've called us to do and that everything that we do will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you praise in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. God bless you all.